Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. There are 19 new members of the Welsh Parliament. One of them is Mabon Ac Gwynfor, the new MS for Dwyfo Merione, then recently appointed by Cymru spokesperson for housing and planning. Thank you for joining us this evening at Mabon. Um, so I think the first question uh, we usually ask in, in these situations is, is who is Mabon? Uh, what got you involved in politics? Well, that's uh, an interesting question to begin with. A uh, number of factors. Um, first of all, anybody who knows me will know uh, the fact that my grandfather was Gwynfor Evans, first member of parliament for Plaid Cymru in Carmarthen, elected in 1966. So, so naturally, there was a, a family interest in politics. I, I took an active interest when I was young and I was involved with, particularly with Cymru Thysariaeth Gymraeg, the Welsh Language Society, and uh, with CND. My, my father is also uh, a minister of religion and his sermons were often political, and still are very political. So the, the household was very political. But then when I went to university, I got involved from the first day in uh, the student union. Um, because my uh, year was the final year to get the student grant. And uh, straight away, as you went to university, I was in Bangor, you saw that some students weren't getting what they wanted and someone needed to fight for them and stand up for them. So I got, I got involved there. And, and, and from then, I, I was active in politics. Well, usually the next question we sort of ask in this situation is, why did you pick the party you picked? But in your, in, in your case, it seems to be fairly uh, understandable but obviously people don't always go and join the parties of their family but was it always Plaid Cymru for you was there any time that you ever thought about joining someone else? I think there's always a time when you question uh, your loyalties your own party and you think whether the direction is right or not and, and that's that's healthy you should always question the direction of your party and, and some of the policies and so yeah you know there are things that other parties say and do which appeal. Some parties will never appeal to me. Uh, I'm a socialist, uh, I'm on the left politically, and so by and large, what the Conservatives say has no appeal to me at all. And what things parties like UKIP say are just repugnant, uh, and, and those far-right parties. But yeah, the, the number of things that other parties say will appeal, and you know, that's, that's again healthy. We need to cooperate, we need to reach out and build bridges. But, um, you know, if you go on, on any of those websites which ask which political party do you think you belong to, then, yeah, I, I <laughs> often and consistent in being the Plaid Cymru camp. Obviously, you've just been elected to the Senate, and congratulations on that. But it must have been a bit of a day of, of mixed emotions for you because of course although you were very happy for yourself being elected it wasn't the best result for Plaid overall. Why do you think that Plaid failed to live up to their hopes and expectations they'd set themselves before the election? I don't know. Um, uh, it's the simple answer. I don't think anybody knows. Um, now I can give you a few reasons why things turned out as they did which aren't excuses um, because we have to accept um, the situation that we find ourselves in, and that is that this was a COVID election. We were in the middle of a pandemic, a public health crisis, the like of which we haven't experienced in, what, 100 years. Clearly, people didn't want to rock the boat. And I think that that's a fair comment. I think it's fair to say that the reason the vote in Duvar Mirionid and in Arvon and in Keredigion and in Nismon increased significantly was because it was a vote of trust by the public in Gwynedd local authority in Keredigion and Nismon because of the way that they've handled the pandemic locally. And I think that's the case across Wales and where you had uh, a local authority which had no overall control, then they went for the, the government in charge, which is Labour. So largely it was, you know, steady as she goes, don't rock the boat. We can't afford to change things significantly uh, during the pandemic. And we saw that in Scotland, we saw that in England uh, as well. We can't escape from that. That's the reality. However, having said that, if we uh, weren't in a pandemic, would we have done better? Yes, I think we would have done better. How much better? I don't know. But you know, there are things we can we can take out from it. Um, you know, Plaid Cymru is part of a wider project. We're part of a wider movement. So as far as the movement is, is concerned, 
it was a successful election for the movement because the debate on independence has shifted significantly. We are now seeing far more talk about what someone might have described previously as Devo Max. I think that's the political will now, that's the accepted will of people in Wales, if you look at the makeup of, of the Synod. Uh, and I look forward to seeing us move in that direction over the next five years. So the political project is, is um, gaining movement and traction. But then if you listen to people like Laura McAllister and Richard Wynne Jones, who say that the point of a political party is to win power, then yeah, it wasn't successful. You know, we lost ground in the valleys. We lost Leanne Wood, which was a huge loss for us. Um, personally as well, uh, Leanne is a good friend. She's a mentor uh, of mine. And, you know, the Synod and Wales is the poorer for not having her in the Synod. You know, could it be that we didn't have uh, a specific focus, a specific message we, which people understood? Probably. Um, I, I think we, we probably had too many messages being reeled out. Um, our, our manifesto was brilliant, really interesting, a lot of ideas, maybe too many. Maybe that was the problem, that there wasn't one fixed message there which people could attach to, especially in the COVID climate. So those are just some ideas there, but you know, it's gonna take a while for us to sift through uh, the ashes of, of the election and try and understand fully what happened. So a lot of people have been talking about this idea of whether Plaid are a political party designed to win power, or to just exert pressure on other political parties to get their agenda implemented. What is it for you? Because obviously you, you are part of this broader movement that wants to see uh, language rights, who wants to see greater self-determination and self-governance for Wales. But a lot of people would, would assume that Plaid Cymru wants to be the party in charge to implement that. We do. So, uh, and, you know, uh, everything you mentioned there should be achieved. The, the realistic way of achieving them is through the ballot box. In order to implement them and gain more powers and ultimately independence, in order to eradicate child poverty, for instance, in order to ensure that education is improved and that uh, elderly people have the best care possible, for instance, then we need to be in power to enforce that change. So, you know, if, if we were in power, it would happen sooner. That's the truth. However, it's still happening, but at, uh, at a slower pace. So, you know, what, what we as a political party are setting out to achieve is happening, but not as fast as we'd like to see it happen. And if we were in power, it would happen faster. So we, we need to be in power and we need to look at why we aren't getting people over to vote for us. We need to see and understand why we're not winning in uh, constituencies. And we need to try and crack that nut. But so far, we haven't achieved it. Let's, let's go back to independence, which, as listeners will know, is one of our favourite topics to talk about. Do you think that Plaid spent too much time talking about independence in what was prima facie a uh, you know, pandemic election? Uh, no, I don't think we spent too much time. In fact, I, I'd say we were catching up on lost time. Uh, we haven't spoken enough about it. Uh, I think in the past, the electorate have accused us of not being honest in, in where we want to be, you know, because uh, historically we've been talking about, uh, you know, uh, home rule. We've been talking about full devolution, whatever that me meant. People didn't really understand what we were talking about and saying, oh, you know, be honest, you want independence. We're saying, no, no not really. We want this, that and the other. So now we're, we're open, we're honest, and, you know, there's no hiding uh, what our aspirations are. And the thing that discussion did was force people to start to think about what an independent Wales could look like and what that might deliver. So in the context of COVID-19, you know, we could reference the fact that Wales were plowing our own furrow and say, look, we are, as a country, albeit Labour in charge, we're plowing our own furrow as far as COVID is concerned, and we're doing better. So imagine what things could be like if we had full control over the other levers of power that we don't have currently. So, you know, that's planted a seed in people's minds and, and that seed will grow undoubtedly and more people will come over to uh, appreciate that argument as time goes on. Do you think Clyde defined independence well enough? Because this is one of the, you know, you talk about Leanne being a mentor and in her recent Sunday Supplement interview, she said that perhaps the concept of independence wasn't well enough defined in order for people to sort of grasp it. Do you think that's been a major 
stumbling block to people voting Pride or voting for other independent sporting parties? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, we, we've got a job of work to do to try and better define what independence will mean to people uh, in, on their, in their daily lives. The front line of the independence debate is the economy. So, you know, we've got to try and map out how uh, an independent Wales would be better off. And clearly, I believe we would be because we'd have the levers of power over uh, economic policy, taxation policies, fiscal policies. And we could direct those policies to improve the lives of every community across Wales. Uh, because what we don't want to see is the recreation of a little Britain in Cardiff, you know, the transferring of power to one corner and, and retaining the, that power in one corner alone, which is what we're finding in the UK. So there is that debate. But I think personally that the biggest debate when it comes to independence is the question around identity. And that's what, when it comes to the referendum, and we will have a referendum at some point, when it comes to the referendum day, the questions will be about uh, people's identity, whether or not they can retain their British identity, whether or not they can retain their English or Scottish or, or European identity in Wales, whether or not you know, things tied to the identity like money, like the, the pound uh, and the sterling, uh, like royalty uh, and the monarchy, these issues which people, uh, it's part of their identity, you know, BBC, Coronation Street, you name it. These are the questions we'll have to ask. And I think that's the, what we need to ensure that people are comfortable with, is that they can retain their identity. They can be English, they can be British, they can be Scottish, they can be whatever they want to be in an independent Wales, but that they have in an independent Wales the power over their own lives. What did you make of what else Leanne said with regards to Clyde's choices in this election and what they need to do in the, in the next one? Did you think she, her, her analysis was correct? Clearly defining independence, uh, talking about strategy and organisation, being very well organised in, in certain parts of, of Wales, uh, but not in others. The, the key with an elections is, is organisation. Um, you know, you need to identify your voters uh, in advance and you need a strategy to get them out. And in order to do that, you need money. Now, there's a cap on the amount of money you can spend during an election period, but there's no cap on the amount of money you can spend before an election period. And so for smaller parties, it is really, really difficult to get that message across, to reach those individuals which you think will, will vote for you, especially when we have a limited media in Wales. So yeah, th there's, there are questions there, uh, wider questions around the paucity and the poverty of Welsh media, uh, which needs to be answered. That can only be answered by the de devolving of, uh, of powers to Wales uh, on broadcasting. And for us internally, there's no point in us using that as an excuse. We need to find other ways of reaching people. And I don't think we've succeeded in developing a strong enough communication policy or, or strategy to convey messages outside of the large uh, media organizations and direct those messages to the individuals we think uh, will be uh, willing to listen to us. Do you think that Pride have focused too heavily on trying to win constituencies in the South Wales Valleys? Do you think that they should now move their attention to, to rural Wales where before there were the Liberal Democrats being the natural opposition party. Do you think that presents an interesting opportunity for Clyde Cymru? I might do, and if you're a, a political strategist, you're looking at the growth we had in, in Montgomery, in Cedar Aldwin, in uh, North Pems. But then again, you know, Carrie Harper in Wrexham had the largest percentage increase in the whole of Wales, as far as Clyde is concerned. So, you know, there's certainly growth for us in, in the towns and cities. We are Plaid Cymru, that's what we call ourselves, a party for the whole of Wales. So I don't think it's, it's healthy for us to just look at, at certain areas, and I don't think it's healthy for us to split Wales up into rural versus urban, or east versus west, north versus south, or whatever it is. If we're serious about uh, going into government, we need to look to grow in every part of Wales. Alson is furious at you, come on. Um, but I'm sure he'll he'll get over it. Um, how have you found how have you found it since being elected? Have you is there anything that surprised you since becoming a, a, a MS? Is do you suddenly feel as though you're under more scrutiny than you were before? I'll be honest, the first two weeks were really difficult uh, mental health wise. 
the expectations. You know, I, I take this role seriously. Uh, I've worked in politics for a number of years and I know how important it is that you uh, represent the people that uh, you've been voted to represent properly, that they ask very difficult questions of you, they ask for your help and assistance and you need to be there for them. And there's no point doing this job half measures because it's not fair on the electorate, it's not fair on the country. Um, you have to do it full on or don't do it at all. So it was really difficult, but you know, I'm starting to get into my straight now, I'm starting to understand uh, the processes a little bit more. And I've got job adverts out there to try and get some staff, trying to find out an office. So that'll make things easier as well. But you know, it, it is exciting because we have an opportunity to mold uh, a new Wales, to form policies to improve people's lives. And yeah, well, there's going to be to and froing. Yeah, there's going to be disagreements. And yeah, disagreement from certain quarters on the right, especially. But I'm convinced that the electorate in Wales are a pro devolution. We've seen that, but want to see more as we've touched on more powers. So that's exciting. That really is exciting. And with that comes expectations uh, and a responsibility. Over half the Plaid Cymru group is new now, isn't it? So obviously that that presents an interesting opportunity to, to to change the way that the party operates in the Senate. Are you excited by the, the prospect of, of, of new blood in the group? Oh, really excited. I get it, as I said, for the loss of, of some of the members. And, you know, those uh, members really had experience and vision and principles. But the new, new lot we've got in there, they're really good people as well, you know. You just look at someone young like Luke, Luke Fletcher, really intelligent, uh, painfully intelligent, and a lot of ideas about how to improve uh, the lives of people across Wales. It's an exciting prospect. I'm trying to link these two things together. So let's talk about increased scrutiny on this new group. I mean, there was a recent Gollog article that, that said about how a group of people with apps in their name is just going to reinforce the idea that Plaid is just for Welsh speakers. What was your guttural reaction to stuff like that? And I mean, there was a comment by Vaughan Roderick as well, sort of after the election, talking about how this is the first Plaid Cymru group uh, made up of exclusively first language Welsh speakers. Does, does stuff like that annoy you, get under your skin at all? Well, that, that last statement isn't strictly true um, because um, Luke's first language is, is English and, yeah. and Adam as well even though that, that statement is, is incorrect. Do you think there is this attempt to, to portray Plaid in a certain way and, and, and misuse information like that? Possibly, but I, regardless of what I said earlier about failures in the campaign and you know, things that working against us, the older I get, the, the, the least I like negative and complaining attitudes in politics. If people throw this at us, then okay, fine, let them throw it at us. Um, we've got to learn to ignore that. And we've got to learn to have our message and convey that message across and not let, let sounds off distract us. So if people want to say that, fine, let them say it. You know, yeah, there, there are a number of apps in, in, in the party. Fine, so what? It's, it's the ideas we hold, it's the work we do, which we should be measured by. and. By the end of the five years, I think you'll have seen one of the most effective Plaid Cymru groups in the Senate since its formation. Well, the role you play in that group is as the new housing spokesperson. Again, for that appointment. Uh, so let's talk about the second homes crisis. You've recently been seen attending protests organised by the group How Leave You Adra. Would you be able to explain to our guests a little bit about, about that and, and what the campaign is about? Okay, specifically looking at some of the rural coastal communities where Welsh is the predominant language, this is an, an ongoing issue. It's been going on for generations. Right? Uh, so back in 1974, a Welsh language band called Edward H. Davis released a song called um, Tea Have, uh, which literally is translated to Summer House, which means Second Home. And it, it's the concern that uh, a number of people uh, are buying homes uh, or houses as second homes in, in those communities, uh, meaning that those houses are empty for most of the year and more and more houses in some communities are being bought as second homes, which pushes the value of houses up to begin with, so that those wanting to live in their communities can't afford to buy homes in their own communities, and so they have to move out, uh, which means communities are 
empty for most of the year. And it also changes the dynamics of that community, um, specifically in this instance, the, the culture and the language of the community. So, you know, the cause celebre, I think, has been Abersoch. And in the centre of Abersoch, over 60% of the houses are owned as second homes or, or holiday lets. Um, and if you go to Abersoch in the winter, it's very quiet. It's it's uh, largely empty, even though there's a very vibrant and active community there. But you know that most of the houses are are empty. And then you know when you when it comes to the summertime, the population has shot up by a factor of ten and more, twenty even. Um, so so th those are the problems facing those uh, communities, and it, it's an ongoing problem. Uh, and as I said, it's been for generations. But this is where I want to emphasize a point and we have to be careful. It's not simply a linguistic problem and it's not simply a problem for Welsh coastal communities. It's been dressed up as that by some people, especially political opponents of Plaid Cymru uh, in the past, very conveniently, which means that they haven't done anything about it. And I'm thinking largely about the, the, the Labour government in, in Wales currently over the last 20 years, and before that, the Labour government and the, the Conservative government in, in London, who did nothing to resolve this. It's a global problem, and it's a problem across Wales. And this is a symptom of a larger housing problem. You've seen it in, in Tiger Bay, as was, you know, in, in Cardiff Bay. You, you've seen it in... Um, valleys communities, we're seeing it in the Mumbles in Swansea, it's the gentrification of communities where capital works against the uh, well-being and the welfare of our communities and those living there. Those with capital, those with money, can afford to buy second homes and price people out of, of their own communities. They are forcing, without realising it more often than not, but they are forcing people on low incomes to move away from their communities be simply because they can't afford to buy houses anymore in the communities because the, the value's shot up because of the power of capital. So that's what we have here. And it's a symptom of a wider problem. It's a problem of the market that there's no control of the market and the market is rampant and without control, it will kill communities and it works against uh, working people and against our uh, language as well. Now, I was going to ask about the, the allegations that some make that these campaigns are xenophobic, but this is the problem no matter where you are. It's just a question of being priced out of where you were, where you were born and raised, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's not xenophobic in any way at all. We, I know of streets where a number of houses are owned by a local individual. Yet yeah, it, it was convenient for some political opponents to try and say that this was uh, anti-English, the, the, the campaign of the last year. And that hurt um, because I have my, my nine was from Liverpool. I have family living in Manchester. There's nothing anti-English about this. People come from anywhere and can buy houses here because of the power of the market, because it's capital that's at play. We've seen in Austria and Denmark, they have policies which say that people from outside those countries can't buy property in those countries unless they were resident there for five years or unless they have work permits. You know, we've seen in Northern Italy the, the way that they have stopped people from outside those communities buying homes there. You know, in Switzerland, it's happening where they put a cap on the number of, of second homes. In New Zealand, um, with the exception of Australia and Singapore, they've stopped people from outside uh, of of the country buying property. So, you know, in Canada, it's in, it happens across the world and other countries are trying to resolve it. In fact, Sadiq Khan in London has brought in measures to try and control Airbnb, you know, and there's nothing xenophobic uh, uh, about that, you know, because he's trying to put measures in place to protect communities in London and London We've seen it happening in London where money has pushed people out of their communities. London has had it uh, as bad or worse than anywhere else. So we need to get over this uh, and, and not pretend it's xenophobic or racist and realize that it's a matter of capital and it's a matter of the rights of individuals to have a roof above their head in their own communities should they wish. 
you made some interesting points recently about Airbnbs in rural communities. Would you be able to explain a little bit about how certain Welsh rural communities compare to, I think you made the comparison with places like Manchester yeah. in regards to how many Airbnb properties there are? So in Gwynedd, for instance, Gwynedd has over 3,700 properties listed on Airbnb and Verbo, VRBO. That's the highest number throughout Wales. I think in Pembrokeshire, it's about 3,200. In Powys, it's about 2,500. In Anismorn, it's 1,500. You're talking there in some of the most rural communities, the most sparsely populated communities in Wales, there are over 10,000 properties listed on, on these uh, short-term let uh, websites. As far as Gwynedd is concerned, it represents about 7% of our housing stock. Now, yeah, on the one hand, someone could say, well, that's entrepreneurship for you. That's good that people are turning their hand to making money, bringing money in. Yeah, there's an argument for that. I, I think you know, some of these houses are, are listed businesses, uh, are genuine businesses. But overall, there's no control over Airbnb. There's no regulation for Airbnb and anybody can put their house up for Airbnb without it being inspected in any way and without any regulation on it. The problem with Airbnb then is that, first of all, a lot of people are buying houses as investment for Airbnb purposes. So it takes that house out of the housing stock. It pushes the value of the house up um, and it pushes the value of houses in that area up. So that's the first problem. The second one is it also pushes rental values up because you can have a situation where someone can, uh, a landlord can decide to rent their house out for £600 a month, see? So that gives them a return of £5,000 a year after costs. Or you can rent your house out on Airbnb for a £1,500 more a week and have a return of £20,000 plus a year. Well, there's no competition there, is there? You know, with that scenario, people will opt for the latter. So not only is that house being taken out of the housing stock, but a rental property is being taken out, out of the housing stock as well. So we've got that, that Airbnb is unregulated and is damaging those communities. And as I said, in Gwynedd, over 3,700 properties listed there. Well, if you look at an area like Greater Manchester, with a population of 2.6 million, nearly the same as Wales, and there's only 2,700 odd properties listed on those uh, websites in Manchester. That's a huge disparity there, and it shows the problem that we are facing in, in our uh, rural communities. I suppose the, the real question then, Mabon, is what should the Welsh Government do? What does the Welsh Parliament need to do to, to solve this crisis? Well, someone needs to do something. I'm not uh, clear as yet. I'm, I'm going to have a meeting next week with with researchers in the field to see what powers the Welsh Senedd and the Welsh government have. We need to be clear what, what those powers are. But, you know, if I, I mentioned Sadiq Khan earlier, he's brought in some measures in London to try and limit the number of days um, that houses are listed on Airbnb. I think it's 90 days. In Palma de Mallorca, uh, the mayor there has said that um, houses listed on Airbnb must be lived in. Uh, like B&Bs were previously, yeah, which would stop the idea of people investing in buying a, a property in order to list an Airbnb. Um, Barcelona, Paris, Amsterdam, Berlin, Prague, they've taken action to try and resolve this. So we need to look at what they've done to try and sort this out. So I'm going to try and reach out to uh, Sadiq Khan's administration and see how they did that. Um, and to other administrations and see what action they've taken and see if we can emulate some of that in, in the Senev. You, you mentioned how this is as a consequence of, of capital, as a consequence of, of the free market. You, you do appear to be slightly trepidatious that the Welsh government lacks the powers to do this. Is this, is this sort of adding fuel to the fire for a more powerful devolved settlement for Wales? Absolutely. And this is the same argument with anything and everything else. That's a problem in our society. If we are serious about tackling this issue, if we are serious about tackling child poverty, if we're serious about instigating UBI, for instance, and other issues, then we need those powers devolved to Wales because London ain't going to do it for us. And 
you can be damn sure that the Conservatives in London aren't going to do this for us. Th there's uh, cross-party support for taking action on these issues in Wales, most of these issues in Wales, but we can't do much about it because of the lack of powers. Um, Mark Drakeford said that he didn't want to see powers over welfare devolve to Wales because he thought that, you know, um, we can wait to see uh, a Labour government in, in London do this for us. Well, you know, we'll be late, waiting a long time, I can tell you. Uh, you know, over the last hundred years, the Conservatives have been in power for 70 plus of those years. So if, if Mark Trickford and the Labour Party in Wales are, are happy to let the Tories uh, reign supreme and maybe wait another 20, 30 years before we do something, then yeah, so be it, he can be happy with that. I'm not confident, I'm not happy with that. We need to see those powers so that we can take action as soon as we can in Wales to try and resolve these issues. And what's more, if we carried those policies out in Wales, we'd become a beacon for other countries. And then brothers and sisters across the border, my family in Manchester, for instance, could point to Wales and say, well, look, they're doing it in Wales, why can't we do this here? So that would empower people in England as well. So the case for independence isn't just a case for Wales, it's a case for communities across these countries and uh, in other countries as well. You know, I, I'm happy and I've worked with, with people in, in Brittany, uh, in Friesland, in Corsica, um, with the Romance people in, in, in Switzerland. We work together across border with people across the world in order to empower communities and empower these stateless people, uh, nations and, and people. And that's how we can uh, achieve uh, better outcomes for our communities. Whilst you're here, and given that you brought it up, the UBI trial, I'm sure, like many, you're very supportive of the idea of a UBI being piloted in Wales. But do you think what the Welsh Government end up doing will actually be a UBI? No, it, it definitely won't. By definition, it won't. It's a BI. They're suggesting a basic income, income for a sector of the community, of society, and that'll be interesting, but it's not UBI. And if you want to see BI at work, they don't need to carry out this test because we've seen it at work in Wales since the Rome Convention because farmers in Wales have received a basic income for the last 60, 70 years. And it means that they've stayed in work, they've invested that money into their communities uh, and ensured that businesses around those farming communities have flourished. So we know that basic income works because the agricultural sector has shown that. Now we need to see if universal basic income will work. I think it will, but this project won't show us that, I don't think. Why do you think they've done it then? Do you think it's just a sort of nod and a wink to the left who back them this time round and hoping they won't go to other parties? It could be that. I think it's it's probably because they're afraid because uh, an UBI would then, a successful UBI trial, would show that we would need the devolution of power over welfare and taxation. And they don't want that. Uh, so, you know, let's be honest about this. This is, is a trial which won't achieve what it aims to achieve right from the start. And, and we know what we need doing in order to have a successful UBI trail. Let's, let's look at happier things and let's look at the next uh, Senate term. What are you hoping to see over the course of the, the, the next Senate term? How do you think that Wales will be different by the time of the next election? I think it's looking at the makeup of this Senate uh, compared to the last time, it's going to be less destructive. We had a number of very destructive individuals and characters in the last Senate, which made it, from someone from the outside, it, it made it look bitter and quarrelsome. And I don't think that's healthy in politics. We need to argue and debate, yes, but we need to reach out and build bridges as well. If we're gonna achieve anything, then you know we need to find common ground um, at times. And that was very difficult last time. So I think we're gonna have a, a more productive synod this time. What we're gonna see by the end of the five years I think we're going to see a movement towards uh, greater devolution. Uh, Devomax, whatever that means, possibly. You know, justice, I think, is next on the cards. Uh, so we'll have movement towards that, I hope. And we'll certainly be pushing for that. Broadcasting as well, it's not 
that far off, I don't think. Um, so we'll see movement towards those things. And I think, you know, we'll see, I, th I hope we'll see more constructive legislation and a more constructive uh, parliament. Mavan Akbimbor, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. It's been great. Thank you very much. And if you want to hear more from us at Hereife, please don't forget to find us on Medium at Hereife Blog Cymru, on Facebook at Hereife Blog Cymru, and on Twitter at Hereife Blog.